policy perspective, what is it that you would like to see happen to encourage that, to improve utilization, to ensure that people actually are not going out there and buying themselves a second or a third car uh, just to be able to get from point A to point B? Uh, we've already seen some governments, for instance, some state governments actually penalize sharing, whether it's Ola share or Uber share or any of that. Uh, what can be done on a government level to actually encourage shared mobility? So, Shireen, the important thing is that innovation will always be ahead of regulation, always. Uh, one of the key things which we've done for the sharing economy is the uh, policy note that we prepared on the sharing economy and gave it to the High, to the high Court of Delhi, which, which enabled the sharing to be pushed in a very big way. And actually, as a consequence of that, if you look at it in India, uh, you know, Ola has actually created 650,000 new entrepreneurs in India. I mean, they're not drivers, they're entrepreneurs. And Uber has created close to about 500,000 uh, new entrepreneurs in India. So there's been a big push, irrespective of one state. Don't worry about one state. But the rest of the country has embraced technology. The courts have embraced technology. The transportation uh, departments have embraced mm. technology. And we've all pushed for this, the sharing economy. How do we ensure that public transportation uh, is actually at the center of the way that we plan and design our cities? Because that clearly isn't happening, or even if it's happening, it's inconsistently happening. 50 cities, 50 metros in India. I mean, unbelievable. It, at different stages I mean, of development. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the aspiration in every single city I mean, every single city I go to, whether it's Varanasi, whether it's Lucknow, whether it's Jaipur, whether it's Bangalore, whether it's Cochin, everywhere it's metro coming up. I mean, all cities just moving forward. I mean, the kind of metro, metro revolution that India is seeing is unbelievable. I mean, uh, or look at the push uh, from metros uh, to uh, high-speed trains mm. to uh, connect, linking up metros to this, or airports getting li linked up to shared vehicles is unbelievable. We are in the midst of one of the biggest technological transportation revolutions in India. Let me, Raj, ask you about the experience that you've had in a country like China. Mm -hmm. And what are the lessons there to be learned as we try and ensure that India has the right mix of public transportation, shared mobility, as well as private vehicles? Yeah, I, you know, I'm very envious of uh, all the cities that launch Metro. The lesson learned is integrating to the public transit network is job number one in shared infrastructure. I think we call it loosely first mile, last mile. It could be the first kilometer, last kilometer. But the notion that you can access the metro seamlessly and that it further connects to all other modes is really the, is the answer in our view. Our lessons that we've learned not just in Shanghai, but in the US as well, all point evidence to that. That if we can leverage the infrastructure mm -hmm. that's shared, mm -hmm. especially the very efficient metro infrastructure, it lets people access that more easily and doesn't put more vehicles on the road. No, yeah. What Raj is merely saying is that China replicated the American <laughs> model of urbanization. <laughs> India shouldn't make that mistake. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're actually saying that, Raj, or not, but, but that's Mr. Kant uh, cleverly sort of slipping that in. But, uh, well, I, I, I worship at the altar of his document <laughs> that he put out in May. Mr. Kant, I, I want to talk to you and go back to the issue of the, uh, the EV plan because that really is uh, something that's occupying mind space uh, here in India and across the world, I would imagine. Uh, you know, power is going to be one of the key challenges. Yeah. And if you don't use electric vehicles in tandem with low carbon power, you're going to face with the be faced with the same consequences of yes. using a petrol or a diesel engine. Uh, how do you overcome that challenge in a market like ours? So, uh, I, I think that's a very important point you've made. And, uh, one of, uh, and that's one of India's key advantages. I think India has key, three key advantages. One is very low per capita usage of vehicles. Secondly, that 80% of its movement is less than five kilometers. And the third is this huge shift which India is making towards solar power. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're putting up 175 gigawatt and you are able to bid out power projects at such low cost, 265 rupees, the latest one, 2 rupees 65 paisa, that means you will be pushing for uh, electric vehicles to be charged on smart power. Mm. That is solar power, and you should be pushing for smart metering, and you should have a very good grid connectivity, and you should be able to have day of time metering. And that will enable you to really have uh, really clean power. India's commitment to the Paris Climate uh, uh, Conference was that we are shifting from coal to 175 gigawatt of solar power. And nobody, no country in the world has had this 
ambition and this very radical transformation towards solar power. Mm. The challenge is how do we link uh, automobile movement to the solar power that we are driving. So city movements will all be driven by solar power and they will all be linked to rooftops and they'll be all linked to electric vehicles and to the day of time meet, smart you, meters. Do you think this will be ready by 2025, 2030 for the, uh, the EV mobility plan? Uh, so it's, it's uh, about people's movement, it's about a lot of innovation on ground and a lot of great entrepreneurship uh, the tremendous amount of energy and vibrancy that we are seeing across India in several cities. I, I just read out the data to you. We, yeah. we, we don't even segregate waste at source in this country, sir. Uh, what do you do about the batteries? Uh, recycle. Recycle. So I'm really glad and I wanted to compliment Ford and I wanted to compliment Raj for thinking about city of tomorrow and more than that, think about the shared and the connected. It's not about just electric vehicles. I think uh, out of the three, sharing and connected is far more critical. And when you think about all this, I think the battery plays a very integral part of it, about recycling of battery. And a huge amount of entrepreneurship work is right now going on in mm. India in terms of how do you recycle battery and how do you recycle especially for two-wheelers in India. In India, in the context of the Smart City mission, and funding is going to be a big challenge, Mr. Kant, because the total cost of projects as of today uh, is 1.89 lakh crore rupees, and this accounts for uh, the 100 smart cities that the government has uh, said that they will put in place by the end of 2017. I don't know. We're almost at the end of 2017, so I don't know what, uh, what is actually going to come off this plan. Uh, there's a lot of talk around municipal bonds, for instance, but from a funding perspective, uh, how much of a challenge is it going to be as we look at expanding the number of smart cities as well? So, Shireen, uh, you keep throwing these numbers. <laughs> but, you know, the important thing is that in urbanization, it's very important to understand this, that in urbanization, the key is that when you do infrastructure, land values go up. And when you go, land values go up, and you should be able to capture the land values and put them back into the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so monetization of land value is really the crux of urbanization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In India, we've not been able to do this effectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, monet upsides of land value when you create infrastructure has either gone to developers on the side of Gurgaon or gone to political parties on the side of Noida. So it's important that once you have a transparent process of capturing land values and putting them back, Money is never a problem. Mm. The challenge is, challenge is that India's bond market must develop. Yeah. And we must have infrastructure projects require 20 to 25 years of bonds. Mm. And we need to ensure that our bond markets develop because uh, these, are, these, these are projects which have gestation period mm. and, gi and they, they give a lot of revenue they club their revenues towards the end of the project. The infrastructure projects in India, and you know this better than I do, uh, have the challenge of time overruns, cost overruns. Uh, you know, you've, you've got a, uh, a laundry list of infrastructure projects that are half done at this point in time, and now you've got a challenge of the private sector being crippled uh, because they're sitting with a mountain of debt, unable to service that debt obligation, and unable to deliver infrastructure projects. So is there now... Uh, time for the government to reimagine the way that we do infrastructure in this country? Uh, Shireen, uh, tell me one country uh, which has been able to crack a project like the Delhi airport ahead of schedule. Mm. Tell me one country in the world. Tell me one country in the world today which has been able to create an airport like the Mumbai airport. Tell me this. You tell, give me the name of one country which China, has been able sir, to... I don't no, want to say it, no, but no, I'll say it. No, no, China, no, no. You, you've got, no, no. You've got, you've got uh, infrastructure no, project uh, after infrastructure no, project as saying. an example. I've, I've been to all China's airports. Yes. I've traveled to all the China. None of them match the brilliance of Mumbai airport. I mean, it's, it's a not, phenomenal. In terms of, I mean, experience and size and scale and, may, and Delhi airport which is cracked on they time. May not, so they I, may not I, match I mean, the experience, yeah, sir, but yeah. the, let's look at the developer no, of the Mumbai airport and who is now suffering on account of uh, the experience no, that, so that, that my, we may have so my view is, uh, My view is that a number of projects in India will keep getting done by government agencies as well. National Highway Authority, etc. A lot of projects will get done. The challenge is when government agencies do these projects, they should be put out for reverse BOT.
mm. they should be, you know, government is good at creating infrastructure, very bad in operation and maintenance. And therefore, they should be put out so that private sector can come in and do the operation and maintenance. And there should be a continuous process of whatever government is creating, whether it's airport, whether it's roads, whether it's highways, to be given out to private sector through a process. All right, we've uh, pretty much come to the end of our time. So Raj, let me uh, wrap this up and get final comments from both you and Mr. Kant. And let me start by asking you, how would you define uh, a city of tomorrow? I think we are accountable for both economic success in the country, but also making the cities livable. For me, the ultimate metric is human ROI. How, how happy are the citizens living in those cities, and how free do they feel in being productive members of society, without the frustration, without the anger, but truly living in a, in a, in a, in a freely mobile infrastructure? And if you can go beyond that, to also include things beyond transport, I think those are all pluses. I, I still feel mobility is a very fundamental human right. And, and for Asia and Asian cities, in particular India, to create that infrastructure is really an obligation on the part of, this, of the government mm -hmm. in collaboration with companies like us. Mr. Khan, city of tomorrow? Well, it should be technologically very creative, uh, it, but it should be culturally very creative as well. Uh, smart city is not about hard infrastructure. Uh, it's about smart people. Uh, you can't have a great smart city without people owning that city and being smart themselves. And I think uh, I'll, I'll end by picking up on what Raj said. I think a city of tomorrow should be able to deliver on the promise of human ROI. And I think that really is going to deliver on the promise and the full potential of our cities for Thank tomorrow. You. Amitabh Khan, Raj, appreciate you joining you. us here on this very special conversation as we discuss the city of tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.